everyone from Fukuoka, Japan, the west coast of Japan. Uh, welcome to yet another video, an unscripted video. I thought about the topic just like five minutes before pressing the record button. And with these unscripted videos, it's a lot, it's, it's really good training for me to learn how to organize my thoughts and uh, whatnot. It's kind of like playing jazz guitar, right? Hopefully you've done all the practicing at home and then after you go out there, you're not really thinking, you just react. Okay, so today I want to talk about gypsy jazz rhythm guitar. Not just gypsy jazz, but it applies to jazz guitar in general. This idea of playing rhythm like this. Well, if you know that I can't use a pick here because it's too loud and I don't want to bother the neighbors. It's kind of like you're not allowed to play music at home in Japan. It's complicated, but anyway. So I'm playing with my thumb here, but it doesn't matter. Okay, this idea of playing chunk, chunk, chunk rhythm, which was very, very popular until about the mid 40s, maybe even the 50s, that culture started to disappear slowly. And there's a lot of lost knowledge, and some people are trying to revive it. That's very, very good. As many of you know, I'm a big fan of accompaniment when it comes to jazz music. It's something that's not talked about enough, in my opinion. We're always focusing on soloing, but rhythm matters okay so the title may seem a little bit clickbaity but not 100 percent it's just that i see all these like videos the seven levels of whatever whatever we're not going to talk about the seven levels of rhythm guitar but we're going to talk about the different stages the different priorities you have to set the priority yourself well, how far do you want to go and i'll be the first to admit that my priority might be a little bit too high and even not even necessary i know it's not necessary because there are very few people who go I guess as far as I do uh, that includes like really really good musicians I'm just very obsessed with it and I would say that I'm going for something really 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 detailed but really you can tone it down maybe a few notches and it'll be good enough so we're going to talk about that so the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, one thing that happens a lot around the world still today is people are confused as to what is quote-unquote authentic gypsy jazz rhythm. I've made many videos about this in the past, so you should watch this, watch those, sorry. But um, what I want to say, I'll just repeat, is that there is no quote-unquote one single authentic way of doing things. It either sounds good or it doesn't. And it's going to be, well, for the most part, quite subjective. But from the perspective of the players that I like, we're talking about like Birel, Lagrin, Angelo, the Barstokler, all like the heavy hitters, there is a kind of a common sound. Um, sound heavy, thick voicings, rumbling sound. This is not this was not invented by the gypsies by the way. This is kind of the way a lot of rhythm guitar players played rhythm in the in the early 30s, late 20s, as the guitar slowly replaced the banjo. You can hear this in recordings of uh, for example Oh, I'm so bad with names. Eddie Lang and all the contemporaries before Django, you hear this kind of sound. I would also urge you to check out uh, early 1940s recordings of Charlie Parker playing Cherokee, Body and Soul, I Found a New Baby with a guitar player named Efridge Ware, if I'm not mistaken. You can hear this, this thick sound as well in his playing. They're playing Cherokee. hear that sound this is very very typical in those days became a bit of a lost art and kind of revived in the gypsy jazz community so that's something that's a sound that is favored by pretty much all the top players now within that broad category there are little variations here there are some people say oh, you should hit all the strings only the bass strings the top strings upstroke downstroke we're not going to talk about that here that's something else I've talked about elsewhere what I want you to know is that different sounds do exist and I highly suggest that you use your ears to listen to the different sounds out there. You can go on my DC Music School, you can check out Nusha Rosenberg, Benji Wintersheim for free, 
Bono Winterstein, those are some of the most famous play, rhythm players in the community. But you go on YouTube, now a lot of bootleg recordings, you can hear a lot of good players. So you can get an idea of what sounds good to you, what doesn't sound good to you. If you go take a lesson with someone, and that someone says something that maybe feels weird to you, you don't disagree, you don't agree with them, well, think of it as this way. Maybe it's their accent. Let's say you're learning English. Um, there's the Australian accent. Um, there's the British accent. There are a few different ones. You go to America, there are a whole bunch of different accents. Same thing in Canada. So which one is the right accent? It doesn't really matter. Well, maybe the right accent is the one where you're going to live, so to speak. So the person that's telling you, oh, this is the correct way to play rhythm, that's the way they want to play it. And if you like the way they play it, you should learn it that way. If you don't, go see someone else. Okay? So that's the first thing about sound. But sound is not enough. Uh, the, the groove is just as important. I, I like to think of sound and groove as two distinct categories that intersect. The, the groove will affect the sound and the sound will affect the groove. So they're both important. And it's kind of like asking what's more important, the brain or the heart? You kind of need both. <laughs> Without the, the brain, maybe the body can still, I mean, you can be kind of brain dead but still alive. But are you really alive? So, so that's the same thing with uh, rhythm guitar. There's also the topic of chord voicings. Which chord voicings to use? That's an even bigger topic. And this is the one where, again, where I'm the where earlier when I said I'm a bit overly obsessed with it, I admit it, whereas others are far less obsessed with it. For me, this become this goes down boils down to um, artistic decisions. It depends on what style you're trying to play, what kind of feel you're trying to evoke. If you're playing like early 1930s jazz, then you should use voicings that are not only just not only voices but chord movements that are appropriate to that style so namely you don't really play minor seven chords instead of minor seven you play uh, two minor seven chords two chords are usually triads and if you play a seven usually in passing like that but more often than not the rhythm guitar player just plays a dominant chord often a ninth maybe so i can't get anything but love I can't give you anything but love. Something like that. If you listen to very early recordings, especially um, early early 30s, late 20s, I don't know when that song was composed, I don't remember. It's just G and D7 if you play it in the key of uh, G. But then as time went on, guitar players added a few little things. to more modern gypsy jazz to minor seven is it a big deal if you play a minor seven chord and you're trying to play in the kind of early 30s style probably not a big deal most people wouldn't even notice this anyway only hardcore nerds like me and even then if i hear it it's like oh well whatever i mean imagine they make like some movie about i don't know world war one and <laughs> someone's carrying like a gun that wasn't invented until like the 1930s but only gun aficionados would even know this like if we're you and me i don't know about you guys but if i were to just watch that movie i, I would have no idea so that's like the level of detail that's maybe not necessarily important to most people but it is to me if you're starting out don't worry too much about those things use whatever chords you know as long as they sound good um, as long as the, the person you're accompanying, the people that you are accompanying think they sound good. If they don't say anything, then it's probably okay. <laughs> and I think if they say something, that's something to consider. So, work on kind of like a decent sound. I would start with something very basic. Without having to do any crazy like... Anything like that. Just keep it very, very simple. And that's, that's a very, very good way to start. Now, the next step is to refine things, both the sound and the groove. As I said, the sound can drastically influence the groove. I'm a victim of this, and I see 
many people uh, fall victim to this as well. When you tend to keep things relatively short on the left hand, for some reason, psychologically, it um, kind of causes many people to want to rush, to speed up, myself included. Whereas when you play more legato, it's the reverse. We tend to slow down. So these are things to be very aware of when you play. And this is probably the right moment to say that which sound should you use? Well, it depends on how you feel. If, like I said, if it sounds good to your ears and to everyone, no one complains, then it's probably fine. But the sound is also dependent on what the other musicians are doing, like especially if there's a bass player or a drummer. In gypsy jazz, most of the time there's no drums, but in swing music, there is drums. Or even in jazz music, uh, regular jazz, sometimes I play with musicians who are uh, modern jazz, where I want to do this kind of chunk chunk to rhythm, but I cannot do it because the drummer is playing in such a way that doesn't make it, it doesn't fit. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't fit. And in the context of gypsy jazz, let's say you're playing a ballad and you want to do this kind of march kind of sound with, uh, let's say, nuage. But if the bass player is playing like this, it totally kills the effect. It just won't work. So you have to listen to what the other players are doing. And hopefully you're playing with good musicians who are also listening to what you're doing. In my opinion, that rarely happens. But yeah, so that's very important. Listening. It's something that musicians don't do enough of, in my opinion. And it's so ironic that we play music, which is a listening thing, but people are not listening for different reasons, just lack of awareness, too comfortable in uh, what they're doing to the point that they don't notice what's going on around them. But I digress. So that's the sound issue you have to think about. Now the tempo issue is where it gets really subjective. Um, we are all human beings. We can never beat a metronome. We can never be perfect like a metronome. It just doesn't exist. Um, and there are a lot of famous gypsy jazz rhythm players or even just players in general who don't even know how to play to a, along to a metronome, but their time feel is very, very, very good, very solid. They know how to play along to an, a real human being with the, all the imperfections. So there's kind of like, hmm, how do you say, an organic thing happening between all the musicians so that we're, they're all together if they're listening to each other. But that said, um, if you're one of those people, I made a video about talent some time ago where even talented people don't even know they're talented. And people who are talented, who don't know that they're talented, often don't have to practice things that people or let's say, quote unquote, less talented, will have to work on. And this applies to me as well, myself. So, with regards to the metronome, um, the goal of the metronome, in my opinion, when it comes to tempo, should be to set the metronome in such a way where you are as much as possible with the metronome, and also while at the same time kind of ignoring it. It's kind of contradictory, I know. What I mean is ignoring that you're just playing and then when you hear the metronome, you're playing, you're focusing on what you're doing and trying to feel your own internal tempo. But somewhere in the back of your mind, as you're listening, you're also listening to the metronome so to see, get a reference to as to where you are. And I, in my opinion, one of the best ways to practice this is to set the metronome uh, where you have maybe only one beat per measure. Maybe even one beat every two measures, one beat every four measures, and, and so on. And so that if you set it like, let's say, one beat a measure, and you start playing, you have to, your brain has to make quick calculations. Am I with the metronome? Am I too early? Am I too ahead? And then as you make, as you hear it, you have to adjust it. So I have a, a metronome app here. It's called Tempo. What you can do is you, actually you can remove beats two, three, and four, or whatever beats you want, just have beat one. Now it's only on beat one, 169 BPM. You can also set it to one beat every two bars. I'm gonna turn it on. 
What I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna go for it. I'm not even gonna count. I'm just gonna start playing where I think the one is and adjust as I go along. Oh, not bad. adjustments and it has to be really fast like that so this is a very good way to practice um, awareness of groove it's a listening exercise of course this might be a bit too hard if you're if you've never done this before and you're interested in doing it what I would suggest then is you turn it on again and now what I did was without even counting and I just went with my gut feel and just started playing and it turned out pretty good in the beginning but now as a beginner I'm gonna take the time to think one two feel it with your body four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then count one two one two three four I sped up. I sped up. Let's do it again. One, two, one, two, three, four. One, two, one, two, three, four. Russian, but just a tiny bit. If it were, without the metronome, it wouldn't be a big deal. It's still we barely noticeable. But because the metronome is there, it's here to remind us. And so it's a it's kind of like a think fast game. You have to listen very carefully. But let's try one last time. really really good so that's a really nice exercise that you can practice it's not gonna give you necessarily amazing time feel but it's gonna teach you to listen to be very hypersensitive and hyper aware but in my opinion the very best way to learn to play gypsy jazz rhythm or rhythm is to play along to play with a lot of great players to give will give you feedback some players will not give you any feedback because maybe they're not hot, they're not aware, or maybe it's good. Maybe what you're doing is good. It serves, it's, they're satisfied with what you do. If that's the case, great. But don't pat yourself on the back yet. Keep playing with more musicians. The more musicians you play with, especially the higher level ones, you're going to realize some will, will be fairly picky. Now, it's also true that some will be picky for no reason. But some also will be picky, uh, but for a good reason. And it, I think it's to your benefit to focus on what they tell you. And because one thing about this rhythm, what I've noticed, especially in Gypsy Jazz, what is very, very common, I've, I've looked at this on a computer with recordings. A lot of players, they put the two in four a little bit ahead of the beat so if you're recording with a metronome and you set it you play perfectly with a metronome it's not a quote-unquote accurate or realistic thing what's often more realistic among gypsy jazz players is what I said putting the two and four ahead of the beat but a lot of these players are not even aware that they're putting the two and four in the beat. it's just how they feel it and one of the reasons that happens especially is when you put that accent on the two and four <laughs> Putting the two and four 
slightly ahead of the beat, it's awful. It's gonna influence. It's gonna affect the groove as well. It's gonna gradually speed up, and that's normal. It's fine. The important thing is that if the tempo, when the tempo fluctuates, in generally it shouldn't be too noticeable to to the average listener, even to the most discerned listener such as myself, it shouldn't be too noticeable. Uh, and that's probably gonna be something really good. But then here comes the subjective nature of rhythm as well. Some people do want it to really push hard, where it speeds up maybe even more no noticeably so. And uh, Angelo Debar, for example, is w one such player. <laughs> when he was in my studio recording, he said to me that my backing tracks were really, really good, but I kept slowing down. But the thing is, I recorded it to a metronome, and I also quantized it. It's 100% perfect. So, that's when I learned that, okay, Angelo is someone who wants it to like really push. And that's the same with actually a lot of Gypsy Jazz players, like Birey Lagrin, etc. Um... I became very aware of this when I started playing with all these really great players who told me to like, you know, come on, give it some energy, that is get push a little bit. But there are also also some musicians who don't want it to push too hard. For example, Chalimberger would tell me right away, Dennis, you're pushing too hard, you gotta like lay back a little bit. And so that's what I mean, like the best way to really learn this is to have the opportunities to play with a whole bunch of different high-level players if some really good player comes to your town and it's something you want to work on instead of having a lesson a traditional lesson maybe pay them for two hours of their time for them uh, to play solo as you play rhythm and try to get constructive feedback the more players you can play with the better and ask them to be very very honest do you feel comfortable playing when when uh, when I play rhythm and if they give you little things like, hey, I think you're playing a little bit too loud. Maybe someone will say you're playing a little bit too soft. It just depends on the player. Um, sometimes loud players, uh, uh, loud solo players rather, who have strong attack, they play so loud that they need, they, they, if you play rhythm too quietly, they won't hear it. In such cases, you, they'll tell you that you, come on, give me a little bit more rhythm. But there, all, it's also true that there are some solos who are on the quieter side, and if you were to play a little bit too loud, they would tell you, hey, you're playing too loud. It, it could be the same volume. You could be playing the same volume that you were playing with the other player, but not with this player. So this is the subjective nature of uh, rhythm guitar playing. So being a good rhythm player is to be at the surface of the soloist. That's why there is this myth in Gypsy Jazz that if you want to play good lead, you have to play good rhythm. I don't agree with that. Well, it depends what you mean by good rhythm, like sophisticated rhythm. Okay, maybe Django plays some sophisticated rhythms, but also sometimes there are some recordings where he's soloing. I think Chasing Shadows is one such recording, if I'm not mistaken. So he does a solo, beautiful solo. Then Grappelli does a solo, and when Django comes in, he starts getting really excited, and the tempo starts to noticeably speed up. I think it's Chasing Shadows in the 1930s. Check out that recording. If it's not that recording, then I apologize. But Django certainly did do a lot of very sophisticated rhythm things. But sometimes, because he's a soloist, he's not really focused on like being the best rhythm player that he can be in terms of supporting someone else. I hope you don't consider this blasphemy. <laughs> so rhythm playing is very much a subjective art. And this were... The next topic I want to talk about is something that uh, I notice a lot of younger players do. Not just younger players, but a lot of players really. When you're playing rhythm, when I play rhythm, I'm really thinking to myself, is what I'm doing supporting the musician? Um, is it necessary for me to do anything more or anything less? Now, for instance, I remember one time I was accompanying a really famous player uh, one of the world's most famous players but it was kind of like an acoustic session where I was playing rhythm for that player but because it was acoustic and there were a lot of people talking it was a lot of noise and we were playing a modal song Flèche d'Or 
the, the solo player <laughs> kind of got pissed off, at me, but it was not my fault. I was playing as loud as I can, but like when there's everyone's talking, it's just very hard. He was telling me, Dennis, you need to help me. You need to like give me signals. Like uh, for example, if uh, the the song fleshed out modals B minor, one two three four. He wanted signals like that, a little F sharp seven. But what I was doing, I was actually playing. things like that to give these little cues but because it was so loud he couldn't hear me but so that's the thing I'm I was very aware that it, it was he could potentially get lost if um, if I wasn't giving good cues and I tried to as best as I could but it's just it was the environment so when you're playing a modal song like that be aware of such things it's not that the great soloist would get lost easily, but the soloist is relying on me to give him something very comfortable to help him out so that he can have more freedom and take risks. When you start to take risks as a soloist, sometimes you stop kind of like counting one, two, three, like the, the, the bars and everything. And then that's when you start to, you, you take your risk, but you also listen to the, the companies to help you find your way back if you take such a big risk that you kind of might get lost. So what I see some people do when they play rhythm is they add these little things and you have to ask them, was it really necessary for you to add those things? Okay, for this thing, like let's say at the end of a turnaround, let's say in the key of G. That's good every now and then, but doing it too much, Another jam session that I went to, I remember where the player was just doing all like distracting things. I don't even remember how it was, but like. It's like too much. It's not that you want to make it too simple, stupid simple, but it's finding that balance between too simple and too much. There's kind of a range there that you have to go for. And if you listen to all these great recordings from Bure Legrand, Rosenberg Trio, Angelo De Bar, when they're playing with their bands and everything, you'll notice that the rhythm players are rarely doing anything too crazy. One thing that happens, let's say you play Nuash, the, the, I see this all the time. No, sorry, that. Let's go to A's. Time. Here it comes. Da, 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 da. If you're the only rhythm player and you start doing this, it kills the beat. The beat is completely gone. Now, artistically, you have the right to do anything you want. It's subjective, right? But most players will not like that. And I always wonder, what were you thinking when you decided it was a good idea for you to do that when you were the only rhythm player? It's just like, it's like you have a heartbeat, especially if you're dancing. You, you, you need that beat. And then after, it suddenly stops. Like, uh, Right? Keep the pulse going because gypsy jazz, well, in the beginning was kind of dance music. It has a pulse. If you lose that pulse, the, the, the feeling is completely gone. My opinion, the opinion of all, of all the best players. I, I tend to have the opinion that all the best players tend to have. So I think your priorities should be decent groove, decent sound and decent musicality don't play too stupid simple i once played with a bass player whose idea of playing bass let's say my all of me was this that's like ridiculous for an effect sure like every now and then you can repeat notes but that was his way of playing walking bass just the same note that's too stupid, simple, and like unmusical. On the other hand, the reverse can be true. You add too much, it's not necessarily musical. You have to really ask yourself, does it serve the music? Listen to your favorite players. There's a reason they're not doing those things that I told you not to do, because they're not musical. And also because the soloist will not want that. Uh, believe me, you know, 
I've had the opportunity to back a lot of the best players uh, in the world. In fact, just in a few weeks, I'm going to play rhythm for Moses Rosenberg in Hong Kong and Taiwan. I'm very grateful that I was invited to do this. But yeah, musicality. Think, uh, really think about it. What was it? Decent sound, decent groove, and uh, musicality. Once you got those three things down, and it's really not a tall order, uh, you're pretty much set. Of course, then you got to learn the songs and everything. That's another topic. Now, let's talk about my obsession with going even deeper with this. Like, I have access to quite a lot of different sounds when I play rhythm. But I can only use these rhythms if I'm playing with good musicians who are like-minded, good bass players, good drummers, everything. Because otherwise, I have, in the service of music, so here's another thing. I know how to do a lot of things, but just because I know how to do all these things doesn't mean I should use it all the time. I'm always thinking about the music. So if I'm playing with a bass player who is not receptive to these different sounds, then I play whatever will make the whole band sound to sound good together. That usually means finding uh, a sound that complements what the bass player is doing. But yeah, this like the idea of short rhythm, long rhythm. Uh, using very specific chord voicing, specific chord movements according to style and whatnot. It's something that I constantly think about. Um, probably one of the very few in the world to really think about this because most people I met meet don't really go that far. And that's just my own personal interest. What I'm trying to say is not is that you hear me talk about these things passionately. Because I love it but I also want to assure you you don't have to go as far as I do <laughs> you'll be good enough with something to a lesser degree of authenticity like for example if someone tells me I want they want me to play in like a very very gypsy way then I'll play in a gypsy using the voicings that they use like minor switch. Want me to play in a hot club way? Use these voices. They want me to play if I'm going for more of a Freddie Green kind of feel. I'm not saying hundred percent like him, but in that kind of in that way of playing, maybe I'll just do like. things that I've kind of worked on and it allows me to create different textures and these textures actually most people don't notice anything but they kind of do notice something they notice something's different without ever knowing exactly what it is because I have gone out of outside of gypsy jazz playing like contemporary jazz standards went out when I've been on stage people have always sometimes told me yeah oh, you're doing something different that I don't hear and I really like it it's again access to all these different comping styles, sounds, and aesthetics to paint different textures. So one big problem with, I guess, the jazz education today is that it's just jazz as one broad category. Whereas I'm going for really detailed things. If I do this, it's going to sound like early 1930s jazz. If I do this, it's going to sound like Count Basie. If I do this, it's going to sound like Django Reinhardt from the mid-30s. If I do this it's gonna sound like Ken, Cam, Freddie Green post-war Freddie Green where he's playing fewer notes a lot of very subtle things like this specific voicings etc you know nowadays there are people around the world playing gypsy jazz um, many of whom have had very very little contact with the gypsy music musicians who kind of revitalized this music and I they copy the licks but 
sometimes, especially in the rhythm where I can tell that they have not really actually noticed some of the little nuances. Often, for example, if you're playing minor swing, if you play this chord as the first chord, and this one, often that's how you can tell uh, hasn't really been influenced by the gypsies. The gypsies instead they play like this. Now, it is true, on occasion sometimes they do play this one, especially in the Netherlands, but often this it's this chord. And this is a typical gypsy D minor. Without the bass too. They do use this one as well, but like there are little movements like that. Tiny tiny details. Again, doesn't make such a huge difference. Not really. If the music is good, it's good. But I'm just telling you how obsessive you can get, and that's kind of how I tend to be. So one guy, I've, I've interviewed him on my channel, Sam Farley, he's 20 years old now. He's from America, but he has the whole accent, the whole sound, the, the exact gypsy vibe. I close my eyes, I can, and I listen to him, I wouldn't be able to tell that he was just some from kid from, uh, I guess, Baltimore, wherever he's from. <laughs> Is it important for you to get that accent? That's for you to decide. But if it's not, then it's fine. So all this to say there are many ways to play gypsy jazz rhythm. If the people that you're playing with are happy, then that's great. Just keep it as it is. Don't really have to change anything. If they're not happy, ask them why and then think about it. Maybe they want you to play rhythm in such a way, in a way that you don't want to play. And therefore, you don't necessarily have to play with that band play with another band, make your own band. If it's the only band that you can play with, well then, <laughs> that's unfortunate. Well, some people, you know, really, some people actually move cities, move countries just to play Gypsy Jazz. I obviously did not. I could have, I don't know why I didn't, but yeah. But if you really want to get good at this, the metronome exercise that I showed is a really good way to develop your sensitivity, but that in itself will not necessarily develop your internal time feel. This is something that you have to do by playing with a lot of musicians who will give you like specific instruction. If they tell you they feel that you're speeding up too much, then you have to adjust. Again, if you feel yourself that you're not speeding up too much, then maybe you don't have to play with a musician. Vice versa, the other the opposite is true. If someone tells you you're slowing down too much, well then something for you to consider. And the more people you get to play with, the more you get to refine this uh, groove sensitivity. And it's the same thing with sound. Some people tell you, don't do this, don't do that, blah, 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 do this, etc. As a rhythm player, you have to have a tremendous, tremendous uh, sense of humility to be at the service of the one you are accompanying. You can't be like, oh, but when I play rhythm for so-and-so, they're not angry at me, they, they love it. Again, that's for that situation, that's great. But for this situation, it's not great. Um, and if you don't like this situation, okay, you have every right not to be in that situation. Go find some other people to play with. That's it's as simple as that. I know there are some players that I've played with who've come, who <laughs> I've probably shared this story before. I usually get two kinds of comments. Well, first of all, most of the time, I'm not in like 100% serious mode. I just have fun, whatever, no big deal. But sometimes when I'm in very serious work mode for a very specific project, like a big festival or whatever, that's where I can get very, very strict about how things should sound. So some people think, A, that I'm super easy to work with. Some people think that I'm extremely difficult to work with. And I remember a conversation between two people, two colleagues, one complained about me being too strict. And the person, the other person said, what do you mean? Dennis is the most easygoing person ever. Why is that? Because the person who was complaining about me couldn't do what I asked them to do. And usually I don't really ask for anything too complicated. So, <laughs> if I may say one thing about myself, you know, I've been invited to play rhythm for a lot of players. I was invited to record Vavao Adler's album alongside the legendary Hono Winterstein. What a tremendous honor. Uh, next month, I was invited to play rhythm for uh, Moses Rosenberg because I'm probably the only person in East Asia who can play the rhythm in that the correct style, the style that he wants. 
um, I've been invited by a lot of players to play rhythm. So I like to think that I'm doing something correct. So, and these are kind of the philosophies that I stand by. And if you kind of follow some of my ideas, then you're probably on the right track to being able to play with your favorite players. There we go, food for thought. Gypsy Jazz Rhythm. Oh yeah.